welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. While we give folks a few minutes to take their virtual seats, I would like to encourage you to share in the chat who you are and where you're tuning in from. Maybe if you're joining us for a professional reason, if this is something you do for a living, we would love to, to hear that. Uh, if you are a Wild Ones member, perhaps include the name of your local chapter. My name is Lisa Olson, and I am coming to you from Centennial, Colorado, which is just south of Denver. And I am the former president and continue to volunteer with the Wild Ones Front Range chapter. I recently heard a saying that the oceans start in Colorado. Colorado's peaks are the highest point of the continental divide, the nation's ridgeline, and our gardens and landscapes are the first line of defense in protecting vital watersheds. I moved to Colorado uh, several years ago from California, where in the Bay Area, signs alongside storm drains declare flows to bay, reminding residents that their gardens are the last line of defense. I am always pleased to see more and more native plants taking root in gardens along the French range, but I get a special thrill when I see permeable pavement and curb cuts and gutter gardens and living roofs and all the elements of green infrastructure that are designed to optimize native plants capacity to help clean up the impacts of urban and suburban development, transportation, industrial and conventional agriculture, and extractive industries like mining and logging. I am excited to learn more about phytoremediation, a word that combines plants, remedies, and mediation. In addition to getting more native plants in the ground, Wild Ones is working to cultivate a community of mindful land stewards. We need plants to help us heal lands wrought by trauma that we inflicted. I am excited and thrilled to see so many people interested in this important and yet often overlooked topic. And it looks like we are at or just past our official start time. So again, I wish a good evening to everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, I am your host, Lisa Olson, and I am chapter liaison at Wild Ones Native Plants Natural Landscapers. On behalf of Wild Ones Executive Director Jane, Jen Ainsworth and the national staff, honorary directors, and the board of directors, we are excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, Native Plants, Phytoremediation, and Green Infrastructure, How Native Plants Can Be Used to Improve Environmental Quality. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We currently have 76 chapters in 23 states. Our chapters provide regionally relevant expertise and resources to both new and tenured native plant enthusiasts. If there is not a chapter in your state, please think about starting one. Tonight's program features Eric Fusile who will be presenting on how native plants and phytoremediation can be used to improve soil, air, and water quality by removing or transforming common environmental contaminants found in urban, suburban, and rural settings. Tonight, you will learn how to pay attention to surrounding land uses and activities to know how to select species for your next native plant project that will benefit the environment beyond providing habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. Eric Fusile is a, an environmental scientist at Olson, where he conducts environmental impact studies and works with civil engineers and landscape architects to minimize the environmental impact from the infrastructure projects they design. Eric serves on Wild One's National Board of Directors and volunteers as chapter president of the Wild One's Ozark chapter, which he founded just two short years ago in 2019. I have a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in live tonight, but this program will be recorded and posted 
on both our website and YouTube channel in a day or two. Eric's going to cover a lot of material with some lengthy terminology, so please don't stress over trying to jot, it, jot down all the terms and plant names as you will have full access to the recording to review the material. We have a series of questions that were submitted prior to this evening's event. And we will do our best to address as many of those questions as we can, both throughout the presentation and in the Q&A session that will follow. We have enabled closed captioning uh, to increase accessibility for the attendees, but you can turn off uh, this feature. You can turn off the transcript um, uh, in your settings if you choose to. And if you have trouble with your audio during the presentation, uh, please go to the test speaker and microphone setting by selecting the up arrow tab next to the mute button. During the presentation, we will be li uh, limiting the chat to messages to the hosts and panelists. Please use it to report any technical issues that you may be having. The chat will be turned back on at the close of Eric's presentation. So please direct any questions you have for Eric to the Q&A. Attendees can upvote questions that they want to know the answer to, and we will answer questions at the end as time allows. And we do have a few moderators who are volunteers, uh, Wild Ones members, and they will be sharing their expertise answering questions as well. And now I would like to turn the program over to our presenter. Please help me welcome Eric Fusile. Eric? Hey, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about uh, two topics that are both very near and dear to my heart, uh, that being native plants and phytoremediation. <clears throat> How can we use uh, native plants to improve environmental quality? And uh, just to assure you, I've cleaned up a little bit from when the photo you see on the uh, slide was taken. Uh, didn't just walk out of a swamp here. Uh, that photo was taken after the, uh, towards the end of a long day of field work uh, in Eastern Arkansas uh, in one of the wildlife refuges out there several years ago when I was doing some work out there with uh, USGS. But uh, anyway, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, like Lisa mentioned, we do have uh, some quite a bit of material to cover, but no worries, this will be recorded. I'm also happy to make my slides available to anyone uh, afterwards who would like to request them. Uh, so feel free to uh, reach out for those. Uh, my email address is on the Wild Ones website. Uh, you can find it there if you go to the board of directors um, and look at my profile and you can reach out to me that way. All right, so native plants, phytoremediation, and green infrastructure. So let's see if I can make this work without screwing anything up. All right, have we advanced uh, slides here? Um, let me know if we haven't, but all right, uh, phytotechnology. And this is um, a much broader term than phytoremediation, but it's really kind of a starting point. Uh, I wanna kind of start with some basics here and introduce some of these concepts. As native plant gardeners and landscapers, we often focus a lot on um, you know, the benefits that the species we're selecting uh, can have for various pollinators, wildlife, you know, and, and th that's all great stuff. I, I, I do the same thing, uh, especially out on my own property. Um, but you know what I would like to really uh, introduce people to is we can be using plants for uh, all kinds of different uh, environmental uh, change or uh, improvement. Uh, we can use plants uh, in place of a lot of other species that we've used in the past or other uh, hard infrastructure uh, that we've used in the past to solve certain engineering problems. So uh, what is phytotechnology? You know, it's kind of funny to think of how plants could be technology. Well, technology is really, you know, how do we use things to achieve a certain end? Well, phytotechnology are plant-based methods of remediating or containing environmental contaminants in soil, sediment, groundwater, or surface water, or using plants to uh, solve a certain scientific or engineering problem. Now, uh, within the broader uh, category of phytotechnology, we have phytoremediation. Uh, with, and these are plant-based approaches to environmental remediation that uses the ability of plants to concentrate elements and compounds from the environment and to detoxify uh, various compounds. And uh, there's different types of um, what's called bioremediation. Some make use of uh, fungus, which is, you know, microremediation. Some makes use of uh, mic microbes and uh, microorganisms. 
you know, and I, I can't speak as much on the, you know, the micro remediation or the microbial remediation. Uh, plants are kind of my shtick. I really enjoy, um, you know, I've always had more of a draw to the plants, uh, but, you know, maybe in time as these different fields of bioremediation develop, uh, we can learn how they can really be integrated uh, to optimize and uh, maximize the benefit uh, that we're having and uh, in improving environmental quality. So what are some things to consider? Uh, and this is where I want you to also, I mean, these concepts can, they can be applied to large scale brownfield, um, you know, remediation sites, but they can also be applied on much smaller scales, whether it be a, a rain garden and bioswell or, you know, a, um, you know, landscaping in a parking lot or in front of a commercial business or in front of your home uh, along a roadside. Uh, maybe, you know, municipalities can uh, specify certain uh, species for certain uh, environmental improvements that I'll go into here uh, in later in my presentation. But uh, when we're wanting to apply these concepts, which uh, I just want to get across that you can apply them on scales from large to small. Uh, and, you know, my hope is the more that we apply these concepts, even on small scales that cumulatively will have, um, you know, on a landscape scale, if more, more and more people, municipalities, businesses are, are strategically placing plants uh, for their environmental uh, improvement, uh, improving environmental quality of stormwater runoff, soil, uh, air, air quality, whatnot, that, you know, on a larger landscape scale that we can have a greater impact uh, to improve things uh, beyond just ecologically, but also uh, the air we breathe, the water we drink. Uh, so I want you to consider Consider the surrounding land uses if you're going to plant a species anywhere on the landscape you know what's going on around that location uh, what's happening upstream you can get on google earth and kind of follow a, a stream or look at where you're at in your watershed what might be coming downhill or down gradient uh, what you might you, is there a prevailing wind direction uh, are you near an industrial part of town uh, is there a certain factory that might be upstream of you um, is there, you know, uphill, is there something that like a dry cleaner, uh, something like that? Is there a parking lot where you might have a runoff or is there, you know, maybe a golf course where uh, pesticides or fungicides, herbicides, whatnot might be being used or sprayed or maybe farm or agricultural activities? Uh, and so, you know, when we consider these surrounding land uses, we can... Um, you know, really start to think strategically about maybe including some species in our landscape designs or gardens or, um, you know, urban street cheese, trees, whatever that may be, uh, that can help um, remediate some of the contaminants that might be originating from some of these land uses. Uh, we also want to select species that are going to be tolerant to those contaminants and that will be migrating to the site. Another thing to consider is that these uh, concepts of phytoremediation are really best suited towards sites that have low to moderate levels of contamination, like kind of like what you would find in stormwater runoff. You know, we're not talking about the BP oil spill or anything like that. You know, that that you know really overloads plants. Uh, it makes it you know really inhibits their ability to grow. But when we're talking about low to moderate levels of contamination. Um, you know, we, we can make use of a plant's ability, natural ability to break down a lot of the, uh, in, the organic contaminants and to even extract some of the inorganic contaminants. And I'll go into a little, uh, that in more detail here in a little bit. But there are various uh, phytotechnological mechanisms that we can use uh, that plants provide. And I have this uh, diagram here that I believe I pulled off of Wiki Commons. And um, it, you know, you can see here, uh, there's several different things listed and we're gonna kind of go through them one by one uh, as just a little bit of background on the different uh, uh, mechanisms that we can make use of. So let's start at the top of this diagram and work our way down. All right, so phytovolatilization. Well, what is phytovolatilization? Well, this refers to, uh, excuse me, I have a little bit of a stuffy nose, so bear with me. Uh, this refers to the absorption of a contaminant by a plant from the soil through its roots, followed by the release of that contaminant or a modified form of that contaminant into the atmosphere uh, via transpiration through the plant's leaves. And the idea here is in the soil, that plant may be uh, at a concentration that is, is considered toxic, but as it works its way through the plant, the plant's uh, different uh, processes, um, you know, might, you know, transform, break down, degrade that contaminant. And by the time it releases it, even if it's releasing it in the same form, uh, when it's in the atmosphere, it's at a much, it's much more diluted uh, and the risk is uh, much lower, even negligible. Uh, so 
that depending on the contaminant, uh, this could be a technique that we could use uh, to uh, improve soil quality by transferring uh, some contaminants into the atmosphere where they pose less or no risk. All right, so the things to consider for wanting to employ this technique are gonna be the evapotranspiration rates of the plants that we use. We wanna use species that are able to move uh, more water from the soil to the atmosphere. Um, you know, this is gonna be better suited to capture those contaminants that are mobilized, whether that be in stormwater or groundwater. So in, in, in this has been employed uh, with, especially with groundwater contamination where they'll use species that like phreatophytes that uh, really rely on groundwater supply for their source of water. And they uh, will plant them in large enough quantities, especially like you know, willows, poplar species, uh, plant them in large enough quality quantities that they can actually um, prevent those um, that uh, contaminants from migrating in those groundwater plumes, uh, suck them up into the plant and slowly over time uh, release those into the atmosphere uh, where they are um, less, uh, lower negligible risk. All right, so what about phytodegradation? This is another uh, form or another phytotechnological mechanism uh, in the scientific literature, you might see it under a different name like phytotransformation or phytometabolism. And this refers to the breakdown of contaminants taken up by the plants uh, through their metabolic processes. So it, the plant takes the, um, the contaminant into its system and through its metabolism breaks it down uh, into uh, a, a form that is less or non-toxic. Uh, or it can refer to um, the breakdown of contaminants external to the plant through the effects of compounds that that plant produces. So this is where pollutants are degraded and either incorporated into the plant tissue or used as nutrients. So when we want to use phytodegradation, we want to make sure that we're selecting fast growing species. These are going to take up and store contaminants faster and in larger amounts than uh, a less, um, you know, more slowly growing species. So fast growing species with high biomass uh, is going to be key uh, when we're trying to employ phytodegradation. All right, now phyto extraction, another term you might see this uh, referred to in the scientific literature is phytoaccumulation. And when we're talking about phyto extraction, this is really geared towards those inorganic contaminants. You know, previously in a lot of the other methods, we're talking about organic contaminants. Those are contaminants that are made up of molecules, more than one element put together. Well, inorganic contaminants, this is, you know, when we look at the periodic table of elements and we see, you know, iron, lead, uh, cadmium, um, nitrogen, you know, just a single element, that's an inorganic contaminant. These cannot be broken down any further. They are already at their most basic elemental level. So how can we uh, remove these from the environment? And this is through phyto extraction. And this is really key if we have uh, an area that where the soil maybe is contaminated with heavy metals, uh, maybe from mining activities, maybe uh, from former lead-based paint, or maybe from uh, old uh, agricultural pesticides uh, that have uh, degraded and left behind high amounts of heavy metal in the soil. Uh, so uh, this uh, is where the plants will take these inorganic contaminants in large amounts, uh, pull them from the soil through the roots, and then translocate them into their above ground parts. Now, after a suitable period of growth has occurred, uh, these plants do have to be harvested and then either incinerated or composted in order to extract those metals. Uh, you know, when plants, especially herbaceous species, uh, when they die, they're just going to fall back down to the ground and you run the risk also of pulling up um, metals like lead deeper from the soil, translocating them to the top of the soil where they might be picked up by windblown dust um, and you know, you increase the risk of exposure uh, to people. So that's where it's important to uh, harvest these plants, especially if they're herbaceous species. Uh, woody species, uh, there are um, plenty of woody species that can uh, sequester these heavy metals into their woody biomass uh, and you know so they can be operating for a much longer period uh, pulling these metals out of the soil and then uh, taken later or um, but you know another thing to consider too is uh, this waste you need to make sure that it is carefully disposed of uh, especially with um, uh, certain heavy metals that like neurotoxins like lead um, so, and we want to consider using species that are known as hyperaccumulators. Uh, these are species that pull up these heavy metals in large quantities. Uh, another uh, uh, type of species would just be an accumulator species, and, and you know these pull up heavy metals and other inorganic contaminants in lesser quantities than the hyperaccumulators. But if we use accumulator species that do have high biomass, uh, produce a lot of biomass, sometimes they can be just as effective as using hyperaccumulator species.
And now we'll go into a, a list of uh, species here later on uh, that are specifically uh, will accumulate or hyperaccumulate heavy metals. All right, now phytostabilization. Uh, and other, you might see this referred to in the scientific literature as in place inactivation, phytosequestration, or rhizofiltration. And what is this? This refers to the use of plants to immobilize contaminants in the soil and groundwater through various mechanisms. That can include absorption and accumulation uh, by the roots of that plant, where they will take in uh, that um, contaminant, accumulate it in the roots, and hold it there. And so you leave that plant in place or adsorption onto the surface of the root or cause that element to precipitate within the root zone uh, into a form where it is then immobile. Now, a key thing to re remember with this is this does not remove the contaminant from the site, but effectively immobilizes or stabilizes it uh, so that it's unavailable for entry into the food chain. And then there is phytostimulation. And this is one that's you know, probably going to be the most commonly used one uh, that we see. And other uh, you know, synonyms you might see uh, referred to in the scientific literature for this technique include enhanced rhizosphere biodegradation, uh, rhizodegradation, and assisted bioremediation or assisted degradation. And the reason for that is uh, this refers to the breakdown of contaminants in the soil through microbial activity that is enhanced by the presence of the rhizosphere. Uh, the rhizosphere, uh, if it's, for anyone who doesn't know, that is the area around the roots where biological activity uh, is occurring, uh, having uh, where it is stimulated uh, by uh, exudates that that root is uh, putting out. So these natural exudates released by the plants include sugars, alcohols, or acids that contain organic carbon. This provides food for soil microorganisms and enhances their uh, biological activity. And so microorganisms like yeast, fungi, bacteria can utilize what to us would be harmful organic substances as their nutrient sources. And we see this commonly applied with uh, petroleum um, contained in runoff. So we'll um, you know, go into some species here for that here in a little bit. But you know, you think about hydrocarbons, hydro, or, you know, these are carbon-based uh, molecules, and these this is food for a lot of different species of microorganisms. Uh, so these be, uh, little microbial species can use these as nutrient sources and degrade them into harmless substances. Now, when we employ this technique, uh, we want to consider uh, the root structure and depth of the plant species that we're using. You know, depth, you know, we want to make sure that plant is able to reach the contaminant. Also, we want to make sure that we're using species that have very fibrous root zones, especially when that contamination is within five feet of the surface. Uh, look at the species of these prairie plants here. These are very fibrous root systems. And the reason these are optimal uh, for phytostimulation is because uh, that rhizosphere occupies a greater volume of the soil beneath that plant than uh, it would under a plant where those roots are much larger or thicker. You know, there's more surface area uh, associated with the roots and uh, of this of these more fibrous root systems. So uh, you're really optimizing or maximizing uh, the benefit and breaking down these contaminants. Um, you know, all plants have the ability to break down. Uh, organic contaminants uh, through this mechanism. It's just that some plants do it better than others. And the plants that have these more fibrous root systems are gonna be much better at breaking down uh, petroleum and other organic contaminants uh, than are plants with thicker, larger root systems that uh, take up where the rhizosphere occupies less of the volume of the soil. The soil. Uh, another thing to consider is that while this is a slower process than phytodegradation, it can still occur during the winter months. Now that might not be so much the case uh, further up north, but uh, in certain latitudes where we have warm enough winter days, we do still have soil microbial activity occurring um, and um, it's just usually at a reduced rate than it would be during the growing season. All right, so then uh, finally phytohydraulics. And this is really down the bottom. Uh, of the diagram, and this is really going to be more applied towards uh, groundwater contamination. This refers to the use of plants that are able to draw groundwater towards the roots in order to you know, change the speed or the direction of that groundwater flow, or to modify groundwater levels. Maybe you want to uh, suck up more of that groundwater uh, to modify the level uh, for one reason or another. So this is where, again, phreatophytes are really going to be helpful. Phreatophytes being species that rely on groundwater for their water supply. Uh, species with high evapotranspiration rates are also going to be ideal. So think here, uh, willows, popular species. 
And again, when we install these in large quantities, uh, we can actually change the direction or the speed that that groundwater is moving in uh, to prevent these uh, contaminants uh, from migrating off site uh, in the groundwater plumes. Uh, this technique can also be applied with phytodegradation and phytovolatilization. So uh, depending on the species, we may be able to pull up the groundwater uh, and then degrade uh, those contaminants through the um, uh, met metabolic processes of the plant and then eventually release it uh, through transpiration through the leaves or just to pull it up from the groundwater and release it through the leaves. Now you really want to be careful and make sure you understand what contamination is there uh, if you're doing this on the level of say a full brownfield site remediation uh, because you know you don't want to be releasing things into the atmosphere that might uh, be toxic in the atmosphere. But uh, with certain contaminants uh, this is a, um, a solution that we can make use of. So what are the benefits of using native species in phytotechnology? I mean, we've, you know, phytotechnology doesn't, we don't have to use native species, um, you know, or it's often, you know, people aren't always using native species for this, but really when we choose native species, and I assume many of you are here today uh, because you already understand the importance of using native species uh, in our landscaping, uh, but just to, um, you know, state it for any ways, you know, native species, they're already part of the web of life. They've been evolving in the region uh, which we find them uh, or which, you know, the region, you know, region which they're native to, uh, and they're part of the local ecology. Uh, they form the base of the food web. Uh, native species of birds, insects, and other wildlife have been co-evolving with these native plant species for millennia, and some species of wildlife have become completely dependent on certain native species of plants in order to complete their life cycles. You know, well, many of us are very familiar uh, with, uh, you know, examples, you know, whether it be bob white quail or monarch butterflies, but when we're using native species for phyto uh, phytoremediation, we can not only be taking part in site remediation, but ecological restoration as well. Not only that, but you know, native species are already going to be adapted to the local climate and conditions of the air region which they're native to. As long as we're planting them uh, in the place where they're going to grow the happiest, you know, as long as you know we're taking you know taking into account their needs for sunlight versus shade versus moist soil versus well-drained soil, uh, other conditions. You know, as long as we're planting them uh, and how they're happy, they're going to do well, and it's going to be more economical to use these uh, than it would be uh, non-native species. And so what are some applications for native plants and phytotechnology? And this is where my hope is that native plant gardeners, landscapers, uh, designers, landscape architects, engineers, uh, over time will become just as knowledgeable about the native plant species that are useful for remediating specific contaminants as we are about the species that are beneficial for specific pollinators. So when we apply these additional functions of native plant species to the landscape in a thoughtful and strategic manner, we can work not only to improve the plight of pollinators, but to improve environmental and uh, quality and restore quality to the environment as a whole. All right, so just a, a brief list of ideas here, uh, various techniques that, uh, you know, where we might normally be including species. And we were, you know, if we're more thoughtful and strategic about certain native species, um, then, you know, we can maximize our uh, impact on improving environments such as, you know, stormwater filters, rain gardens, bioswells, detention ponds. Uh, here uh, in the part of the country I'm in, anytime they develop a new residential subdivision, there's a detention pond that accepts stormwater from that subdivision. Oftentimes I see these detention ponds planted, you know, with Bermuda grass or, you know, some non-native grass. And I just think these could be so much more, you know, turn these things into giant, you know, rain gardens. So um, interception headroads, riparian buffers, uh, urban forestry, depending on the parts of the town, we can choose species that might be helpful uh, with remediating certain contaminants, say, from the industrial part of town versus uh, the residential part of town, commercial and residential landscaping. All of these are opportunities to choose uh, be, uh, native species and to be strategic about the species to make sure that we're at least including some in there that are going to improve environmental quality in addition to providing habitat for wildlife. So what is green infrastructure? These are engineered systems such as rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs that mimic the functions of natural systems such as wetlands. Uh, these are often uh, um, associated with stormwater uh, control, it provides localized flood control, reduce the flow and intensity of creeks during storm events. You know, by slowing down stormwater, storing it, spreading it out, uh, this helps to um, uh, 
prevent uh, the intensity of creek flows downstream, uh, which, you know, often leads to erosion and loss of life, loss of property, all kinds of issues. Uh, Green infrastructure helps improve water quality by filtering that stormwater, by using the soil's natural ability to break down these contaminants and the, uh, the roots and the plants' uh, natural ability to break down these contaminants. It increases uh, recharge of groundwater supplies. The more uh, uh, stormwater that's able to infiltrate the soil, the more is able to get to aquifers and groundwater and the less runs off um, across the surface of uh, whatever impervious surface it might be on uh, and into the nearest creek. So we have a way to filter it and purify it and clean it before it gets into a local aquatic ecosystem where certain contaminants that might be contained in that runoff, whether it be uh, pesticides or petroleum might wreak havoc on those aquatic ecosystems. So these are the contaminants I'm gonna be covering here today. Uh, we're gonna start off with petroleum products, move through pesticides, chlorinated solvents, and talk a little bit about heavy metals, and then uh, go into how we can use plants to improve outdoor air pollution. So petroleum products. And I want you to look at this uh, background photo I have. We have a uh, stormwater drain accepting rainwater from a parking lot. And we all know that there are many, many uh, vehicles out there that, you know, drip. Uh, they, they're either leaky, they're old, whatnot. And if you ever visit a parking lot, you know, especially a parking lot that gets a lot of traffic, uh, you know, when it's empty, you'll notice that there are stains all over. And whenever we have a heavy rain, uh, some of the whatever material it is, often uh, a petroleum product of some kind or automobile fluid is going to become dislodged from the pavement and carried off by that stormwater. So uh, where do these go? Well, these often go to the nearest storm drain and into the nearest creek. Uh, but what if we were able to filter them first before they went to the nearest creek? What if we can have it pass? Okay, I just heard that the recording stopped there for a little bit. Um, all right, so what if we're able to get this, uh, to, you know, to you know, clean and purify it before uh, we go into the, um, you know, the nearest aquatic ecosystem? All right, so what are some phytotechnological processes for petroleum products? And you know, I want to distinguish between. Uh, some petroleum products are going to be much easier to degrade. You know, this includes gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, methyl terbutyl ether, uh, the BTEX, you know, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, and other aliphatic hydrocarbons. And these easier to degrade petroleum uh, compounds, uh, you use a, a wider range of techniques uh, to address these from phytostimulation to phytodegradation or phytohydraulics and phytovolatilization. However, there are some uh, petroleum products that are harder to degrade, and these leave us with less uh, techniques in order to, um, to make use to remediate these. And, you know, we're really kind of limited to phytostimulation when it comes to things like coal tar, crude oil, heating oil, or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So what are some sources of petroleum in our environment? Well, uh, these can include from fuel spills and leaks. Um, you know, like I mentioned, look at this uh, picture of the underside of a car. Uh, that's not uncommon, especially with older vehicles, uh, to have these little drips uh, here and there. Uh, leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, these are often associated with gas stations. If we, um, you know, if the, the underground storage tanks that hold uh, gasoline and diesel uh, typically last maybe 30 years. So when you have a gas station where these tanks might have been installed in the, in the 80s or before, uh, it's not uncommon for these things to develop uh, leaks. Uh, they start getting water into the gas tank, and um, usually that's a sign that there's a leak somewhere. Well, if water's getting in, then fuel is getting out. Uh, and that's why uh, DEQs have to go around or uh, you know, maintain inspections of these things. And um, uh, whenever they have discovered a leaking underground storage tank, they often have to first determine, well, how far has that uh, contamination spread? And then you know, what's the extent of it and how can we improve it? But oftentimes before it's uh, detected, you know, the damage is already done. Um, so um, well, if we can include species uh, planted around uh, underground storage tanks that contain petroleum products, then we could potentially uh, head off some of that damage or reduce it before uh, it you know, gets too far along. Uh, also, um, another sources include petroleum extraction activities or even creosote treated wood, uh, railroad ties. Um, you know, these things are, are leaching uh, you know, these petroleum products into the soil around them. So uh, what are some species that we can use to remediate uh, petroleum contamination? Well, you know, many of these are going to be very familiar with. Big blue stem, 
uh, is able to help out with these uh, harder to degrade uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And again, this is one of those, what they call the big four of the uh, native warm season grasses. And I want you to remember these big four because if you live in a part of the country where these are native to these, you'll find uh, that these come up a lot through my presentation. They, they um, are very helpful when it comes to remediating environmental contaminants. Uh, little blue stem, again, uh, helpful with these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, another one of the big four. So we got blue, big blue stem, little blue stem, and then switchgrass. You know, switchgrass is able uh, to help out with total petroleum hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pyrene and anthracene, another one of the big four. And then the other big four, uh, the fourth one is Indian grass, also able to help out uh, with PAHs and T TPH. And just to give a few more, um, you know, we have blue gramma, side oats gramma, the Budalua, uh, how do you say this, curtipendula. Prairie cordgrass, eastern gamma grass, what is uh, thought to be one of the ancestral plants of our modern corn. And then bottle brush grass, one of our wild rye, this is a cool season grass, along with Canada wild rye, another cool season grass. So if you wanna get a mixture of warm and cool season grasses so that you're able to have that phytostimulation uh, throughout uh, the entire year, um, that could be one uh, particular strategy that we employ. Juncus effusus or common rush uh, in the part of the country I am and uh, you know a lot of uh, North America, this is a pretty common species of rush that we find in the lower uh, wetter areas. Perfect for a rain garden, green bulrush. Nodding bulrush, another scurpus species. Oval head sedge, getting into some carex like Carex stricta or tussock sedge, broadleaf cattail, an arrowhead, Sagittaria latifolia. You know, so maybe you have an aquascape project. Uh, I've seen, you know, that's a pretty common thing to see, uh, you know, in uh, corporate or community parks, something like that. You know, arrowhead might be a species that you um, uh, select, especially if there's a runoff being accepted into that aqua escape uh, from a local parking lot or residential area. Common sunflower, the Helianthus annuus, you know, the native variety, not the cultivars that, you know, we see. I mean, maybe those are effective, I don't know, uh, but uh, the studies I've seen have uh, focused on uh, the straight species. And Cinna obtusifolia, or coffee weed. So what are some potential areas <clears throat> that we could <clears throat> plant these species? Well, what about locations that receive stormwater from roadsides, uh, parking lots, gas stations, uh, machine repair shops, rail yards, rail tracks, uh, any railroad corridor, uh, or oil and gas refineries, you know, having these uh, planted in these areas, maybe you're a landscape architect or you live uh, near some of these areas, or maybe you have a community garden project in one of these areas, or you're a uh, municipal planner and you can, um, you know, uh, specify that some of these species be planted near some of these land use areas in order to help improve any of the runoff that comes uh, from these uh, particular land uses. All right, so what about pesticides? Maybe you live in an agricultural or rural area. Um, so maybe you wanna consider some species um, or maybe you own a farm. Uh, we wanna use these species in locations that receive stormwater uh, from uh, residential areas as well. Uh, orchards, rail corridors, utility corridors. So what about big blue stem? Like I mentioned, the big four, this is able to help with atrazine, which is a widely used herbicide uh, used primarily in agriculture, uh, can be applied uh, both before and after planting to control um, broadleaf and grassy weeds. Uh, Chlorpyrifos, um, this is an insecticide that's used primarily to control foliage and soil-borne uh, insect pests. Pendimethylin is a selective herbicide uh, that's used to control broadleaf weeds and grassy weed species in a number of crops and non-crop areas, as well as residential lawns and on ornamentals. And then uh, propoconazole is a fungicide uh, primarily used agriculturally or on turf grasses that are grown for seed and aesthetic and athletic value, as well as wheat, uh, mushrooms, corn, peanuts, uh, almonds, and a variety of other uh, fruits and uh, not some other edible agricultural products. So uh, big blue stem uh, maybe as, um, you know, planted 
you know, around these areas where these types of agricultural activities are happening. Again, that's that big four. I want you to remember big blue stem. It's uh, a very important one uh, when it comes to improving environmental quality. Switchgrass, like I mentioned, uh, atrazine and pendimethalin earlier. Uh, this one's able to help with both of these as well. Another one of those big four. And then another one of our big four is Indian grass, also able to help with atrazine and pendimethalin. Eastern gamma grass, again, able to help with the chlorpyrifos, uh, uh, and then pendimethalin and uh, some of these others. Broadleaf cattail, again, with the atrazine commonly used um, in residential areas. Uh, black willow is able to help remediate uh, bentazone, which is an herbicide used to control annual weeds. Uh, it's highly soluble in water, volatile, and um, very mobile, and uh, produces a, a risk to, um, of leaching into groundwater. So uh, these black willow species, uh, which is a phreatophyte, is able to uh, suck up uh, some of that um, from that groundwater and help remediate that uh, river birch. Uh, is able to help with bentazone, which is a selective herbicide that's used on lawns and turf. Uh, as well as agriculturally in rice, corns, uh, peanuts, beans, peas, and other um, agricultural products. And we have Eastern Cottonwood. Uh, it's able to help remediate alichlor. Uh, this is an herbicide used for weed control on corn, soybeans, sorghum, peanuts, and beans, as well as uh, dioxane, which is another herbicide. And then uh, metalachlor, which is an herbicide used in agriculture for grass and broadleaf weeds uh, to control these within corn, soybean, uh, sorghum fields, uh, as well as cotton and peanuts. So uh, these cottonwoods, um, you know, would be very beneficial to have these uh, near these fields that are um, um, maybe making use of some of these pesticides. Uh, red mulberry, helpful in remediating anthracene. All right, so what about chlorinated solvents? Well, what are chlorinated solvents? <clears throat> These are used in all kinds of different uh, activities from you know, cleaners, degreasers, uh, rocket propellants, fire retardants, and refrigerants. Uh, these are, you know, um, like an example would be trichloroethylene. This is a solvent that's often used in the dry cleaning process, as well as rubber production and for degreasing metal parts during the manufacturing process. So, uh, American sweet gum has uh, shown the ability to help remediate trichloroethylene. So, as well as Eastern cottonwood, which is also in addition to trichloroethylene, uh, research has shown its ability to help remediate perchloroethylene, which is a, the most common solvent used for dry cleaning in the US. Uh, one thing I do in my job are environmental site assessments. And um, I did one on a historic dry cleaner that had been in operation uh, for oh, about five decades, since the 70s, maybe the 80s. And uh, one thing I discovered in research in the history of that property is, you know, there was a time uh, not so far in the distant past when uh, they, the byproducts uh, that they were storing of the dry cleaning process, they had a container uh, outside that they stored that in, uh, but it had no secondary containment system. And so every time it would rain, uh, that container would top off and overflow and uh, that TCE, PCE would overflow and uh, spread through the parking lot and uh, contaminated the soil uh, heavily. So they had to uh, at one point in the past, uh, clean up that soil. Uh, since then, they ended up getting the secondary containment system so that that wouldn't occur again. But you see this a lot in historic dry cleaners uh, in areas, you know, especially when they were, have been in operation a long time. That's a long time for accidents to happen, spills to happen, uh, maybe in uh, times when things were a little less uh, regulated or people were a little less aware of uh, the harmful effects of some of these chemicals. Uh, also, I mean, um, uh, pentachlorophenol, or PCP, is an industrial wood preservative used mainly to treat utility poles and cross arms. So this is another source of these chlorinated solvents uh, in the environment. Eastern redbud, uh, in addition to being able to uh, remediate PCE and TCE, it's also able to help out with vinyl chlorides. So uh, vinyl chloride is formed when the soil microorganisms break down these chlorinated solvents. You often get uh, vinyl chloride as a... Um, a, a byproduct. It's also found in the air around factories that produce uh, vinyl products. So, and it may eventually settle in uh, the soil. Silver maple, again, vinyl chloride and uh, trichloroethylene. American sycamore, river birch, pin oak, 
mean, a lot of things, these I think would just be great, um, either whether that be in industrial areas or uh, parking lots uh, where dry cleaning activities are occurring. Uh, Black Willow, great for a detention pond or um, some sort of a, a containment system that might be containing runoff. Oh. And then goldenrod, blue stem goldenrod, elm leaf goldenrod, as well as stiff goldenrod have all been shown to have the ability to uh, remediate perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene. Eastern gamma grass. So potential locations where we can use these species, well, we can use them in locations that receive stormwater from, like I mentioned, dry cleaners, industrial sites, rail maintenance yards, where they're using those degreasers to clean off those rail cars, auto body shops, and defense sites. If you recall, uh, rocket propellant, uh, it's another use for the, some of these um, chlorinated solvents. Now, moving on to some inorganic contaminants or the heavy metals. Um, no, 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 not that kind of heavy metal. Okay, yeah, there we go, that kind of heavy metal. We're talking about those, the periodic table of elements. You know, you cannot break these down uh, into a, a smaller, more simpler form. Uh, these are already bound down to the, uh, the basic element that they're already at. I mean, chromium, nickel, this is the periodic table of elements, folks. This is why we call these inorganic contaminants. So remember, uh, with these, we have to use phyto extraction. We wanna choose a hyper accumulator species or accumulator species that produce a lot of biomass. Uh, but remember the key there is, uh, especially if they're herbaceous species, each year they need to be harvested and removed from the site in order for those heavy metals uh, to be removed from that site. Otherwise, they're just being brought down and uh, put back onto the top of the soil. Um, or, you know, if we choose woody species, uh, these heavy metals can be sequestered into the woody biomass, and that's a, a better, more long-term uh, storage solution, potentially. Uh, so what about chromium? Sources of chromium in the environment include dyes, paints, leather tanning, uh, the automotive industry, and pressure-treated lumber. Uh, well, pale smartweed or Persicaria lepathifolia has been shown to be a hyperaccumulator of chromium. Uh, duckweed species, the limna species, uh, can accumulate uh, chromium. And, you know, if anybody has seen a pond uh, where duckweed has taken over, you know that this does produce quite a bit of biomass. Uh, it's just a matter of having to harvest that duckweed out of that pond uh, each year. Uh, American water lily, accumulator of chromium. And Canadian horseweed, not a very particularly uh, beautiful plant, uh, but when it comes to heavy metals, uh, you'll find uh, through this section of my presentation that this is one of the rock stars of the heavy metal remediation world, as I like to refer to this one. Gives you a whole new outlook on some of these species that are less attractive in the garden landscaping section, uh, or um, gardening or landscaping um, use. You know, they have uh, all kinds of other beneficial uses uh, for other things beyond um, just pretty flowers or uh, wildlife. All right, nickel. Uh, this sources of a nickel in the environment include the burning of fossil fuels, uh, battery production, windblown dust from industrial areas. Uh, they've also, there's a new emerging um, field of study called phyto mining, and they've had a lot of success with uh, phyto mining of nickel from nickel contaminated soils. I have not been able to find research yet on native species that they've used, but I believe with a lot of the brassica uh, species, they've had a lot of success with pulling nickel out of the soil and then uh, processing these plants and reclaiming that nickel. So if this, you know, if phyto mining became, uh, if we became more uh, effective at that, um, we were able to invest more in studying how can we use um, this technique to not only only improve soil, uh, you know, of, you know, remove these heavy metals, but also uh, reuse some of these heavy metals instead of having to dig them from deep down in the earth. All right, so hairy goldenrod is a hyperaccumulator of nickel. Uh, balsam groundsel, another hyperaccumulator species. Black locust. Sunflowers are accumulator species of nickel. And again, here's that Canadian horseweed. Dog fennel. Black willow. Then we have copper. You know, sources of this in the environment include wire production, pipe production, electronics, pesticides. You know, this is when you might consider like, you know, historic farms and orchards uh, using some of these species. Uh, pale smartweed, again, another hyper accumulator this time of copper. We have one of our big four, little blue stem. Another one of our big fours, uh, big blue stem. And side oats gramma. Again, sunflower, fox sedge, 
and American water lily. Pondweed. Again, duckweed. This one, uh, Limda minor, has been shown uh, to be able to accumulate copper in large quantities. Uh, false indigo bush and black willow. All right, zinc. Uh, sources of zinc include smelting operations, mining activities, uh, metal roofing and paneling, and tire debris. Think about uh, roads and highways and interstates that have high traffic volumes. You know, your tires over time a little bit get shaved off at a time. That's why we have to replace our tires on our vehicles. Well, where, where does all that tire dust go? Well, oftentimes it gets up on along the roadside. Um, you know, soils along the, uh, especially like you know, heavily tra heavy traffic roadsides and interstates are often contaminated with zinc. So if we have species planted here that, um, you know, maybe these uh, can be used, um, you know, pull up some of the zinc, um, if, you know, or maybe choose some woody species that are able to accumulate zinc uh, for just, um, if you know, in the roadside, it's not necessarily feasible to go remove uh, the plants each and every year. Um, you know, you might reserve that for a uh, location like with mining activities or steel production, something like that, or some zinc contamination um, like that. But roadsides, we may choose uh, other species, uh, maybe that sequester these. Uh, Canadian horseweed, again, that's that rock star. Uh, sunflower, Eastern gamma grass, and then here's black willow. All right, what about cadmium? Uh, sources of cadmium include our fertilizer, sewage sludge, uh, nickel cadmium batteries, uh, stabilizers and plastics, melting operations, switchgrass, hyperaccumulator of cadmium, sunflower is an accumulator, Jerusalem artichoke, and codman yarrow, dog fennel, Canadian horseweed, and rattlebush, says Bania drumundii. Again, fox sedge. We're getting into some woody species, deciduous holly, and American holly, black willow, sandbar willow. All right, and finally, lead. Uh, well, what are some sources of lead in our environment? Well, before 1978, lead-based paints were uh, commonly used. Uh, before 1986, lead-based pipe or lead pipes and plumbing fixtures. And before 96, we had leaded gasoline. So think about roadsides, uh, you know, long roads that have been around uh, since, you know, for a while before the, the you know, the 96 ban on lead. Uh, based gasoline. And so, um, you know, runoff from these roadsides uh, contain uh, little pieces and drips here and there of uh, lead, lead gasoline. And, um, you know, that lead uh, often contaminates these roadside ditches. Current sources include industrial facilities, batteries, and ammunition. You know, you hear about lead shot, uh, you know, it's commonly used by people that hunt waterfowl and that shot just goes into the bottom of, of some of our wetlands and the waterfowl uh, get lead contamination. Well, switchgrass is a hyperaccumulator of lead. Hell smartweed. And to give you a whole new appreciation for annual ragweed, uh, this is a hyperaccumulator of lead. Now, one thing about lead is uh, to make it mobile, sometimes you have to use a chelator. Uh, which uh, combines with the lead uh, and facilitate its um, uptake by plants. Uh, the risk with that, though, uh, is you could also make it mobile and it could leach out into groundwater. So be very careful when it comes uh, to any sort of lead contaminated. If you have lead in high, a large enough quantity that you don't want that to, to be migrating too much off site. All right, so what about outdoor air pollution? Let's start off talking about particulate matter and you know, sources of particulates in our air come from industrial activities, automobile emissions, oil and gas refineries, and coal burning power plants. Uh, you know, these particulates can also carry heavy metals that are combined to them. Uh, they attach these uh, particulates, and, you know, including lead. Uh, they've done studies on uh, traffic cops back in the days of lead, uh, leaded gasoline. Traffic cops were getting, especially in, uh, you know, dense urban areas like New York City, were getting a lot of exposure uh, to lead just from breeding automobile exhaust. Uh, also, these particulates can settle onto leaf surfaces and some will be absorbed by the plant. So how can we make use of uh, plants in order to remove particulates from our atmosphere? Well, one thing, the ultra fine particles or those that are two and a half microns or smaller, um, or, you know, 
these are the ones that are even worse uh, for air quality. You know, you have basically two classes uh, that they divide particulates into so those that are uh, two and a half microns or smaller and those that are uh, larger than that. Uh, so these ultra fine particles are able to lodge themselves more deeply into our lung tissue. Uh, they pose more of a risk, not to say that the larger particulates aren't also at risk. This is oftentimes we're able to expel some of those larger particulates much easier uh, than we can these ultra fine particles. We breathe enough of these and, uh, you know, we, we can't get them out of our lungs. Uh, so conifers or, you know, I should really specify these needle leaved trees because uh, not all, uh, um, you know, not, you know, anyway, needle leaf trees are going to be more effective uh, than broadleaf trees. Uh, instead of deciduous, not all uh, deciduous trees are, of course, you know, broad leaved, or, uh, but uh, broad leaves are, aren't going to be as good as conifers for those ultra fine particles. But if we do choose uh, broad leaf trees, uh, we can, we should choose species that have waxy leaf coatings uh, or, you know, fuzzy, hairy leaves and have a greater leaf area index. So just give some uh, recommendations for species that fit uh, one or uh, more of these criteria. Uh, short leaf pine. In my part of the country, this is our, our most common native pine. Uh, south of where I am, uh, southern United States, you have the loblolly pine. Eastern United States, the Virginia pine. And then up, you know, north, uh, northern U.S., uh, the white pine. You know, American holly, uh, a great example of a plant with these waxy leaves, as well as a southern magnolia. Uh, a yellow poplar, a tulip poplar. A black tupelo. And some of our oak species do have waxy leaves like our northern red oak, post oak, cherry bark oak, black cherry trees. Common nine bark, uh, it's a little bit smaller of a, sh a shrub similar to one of our viburnums, rusty black hole, it's very waxy leaves. So where can we consider these species? Well, what about along urban roadways and interstates, uh, interstates that have these high traffic volumes where particulates are going to be uh, coming out of the automobile exhaust. When, you know, if we have these types of trees, um, especially, you know, uh, if we think about this, when we plant um, trees in these areas, then, um, you know, we can help improve air quality by capturing some of these particulates and uh, preventing them from uh, migrating too far from uh, that, um, um, that roadway. Uh, studies have shown that, um, I believe it's, oh, I can't remember how many feet away from this roadway these continue to have a beneficial impact. So just because you're maybe not right along the edge of a roadway, but maybe, you know, you're still close enough to it, um, you might still consider planting some of the, those trees, uh, the, you know, the, the needle leaf trees or waxy broadleaf trees. Also in or near industrial districts, uh, near oil refineries and coal burning power plants. All right, so what about nitrogen dioxide? Sources of this in our atmosphere include burning fossil fuels, automobile emissions, power plants. And when this uh, gets uh, um, too concentrated in our atmosphere, it's, it is bad for our lung tissue. Uh, it is known to damage tissue. Well, they have conducted uh, a study, uh, I can't recall by who, but I had the paper there and they looked at 70 different species, trying to find species that um, A, uh, had a high assimilation rate of uh, NO2 into its plant tissue. So able to take NO2 in through its leaves and incorporate it into its tissue in high, uh, in high ratios. Uh, and A, B, uh, were highly resistant to tissue damage from NO2. And of those 70 species they looked at, four species they found met both of those criteria. Well, of those four species, uh, black locust uh, was the one that uh, was native to uh, North America. So Robinia pseudoacacia uh, has a high assimilation of NO2 and a high resistance to damage, uh, tissue damage from NO2. So if we were to plant the species in locations where NO2 emissions are high, whether it be uh, near uh, airports and roadways or industrial areas, uh, this could uh, help reduce the amount of NO2 in our atmosphere. Um, um, to help improve air quality. All right, so what about carbon dioxide? That's probably, uh, you know, one of the more uh, the serious uh, things in our atmosphere we need to think about and consider um, removing from our atmosphere. Well, and this is where carbon sequestration is going to be uh, important. 
So what do we need to do for carbon sequestration? Well, trees are gonna be uh, a great option when it comes to, uh, to choosing plants. We're gonna need fast growing trees. These are gonna be able to store the most carbon during their first decades. Also long lived trees. We don't want trees that are gonna be short lived and die because when they decompose, they release that carbon right back into the atmosphere. So something that's able to sequester that carbon for a long period would be ideal. And also trees with large leaves and wide crowns. Uh, this helps maximize photosynthesis. Photosynthesis being that activity where they're pulling carbon dioxide uh, from uh, the atmosphere through their leaves, uh, combining it with water, uh, a little bit of sunlight to, as a catalyst, uh, and a byproduct of that, of course, is oxygen. But that carbon is sequestered into their biomass. So bald cypress. Um, you know, probably one of the better ones. Its average lifespan is 600 years, uh, maximum lifespan typically about 1800 years. So very long lived and these can, things can grow very large. White ash has an average lifespan of 260 years. Black Tupelo, average lifespan of 250 years. Yellow poplar, also 250 years, very long lived trees. White pine, all, you know, these are all considered fast growing or moderately uh, fast growing species. Short leaf pine, white oak, chestnut oak, northern red oak, and live oak. Now here's the thing, um, you know, when they look at the, you know, soil versus um, plants, they found that our flora or our soils really, I don't want to say that our flora are overvalued, because uh, I really do believe that our flora, flora are still undervalued, but I think our soils are very much undervalued. Uh, so I wanted to uh, show this uh, diagram that was put out by the World Climate Council, uh, showing that how much uh, carbon can be sequestered in the soils versus the above ground biomass of different ecosystems. And you really see here wetlands, boreal forests, and temperate grasslands uh, being able to sequester the most. So while native plants are helpful in sequestering carbon, the soil beneath these native plants can play an even greater role in helping fight climate change. So this is why we really need to focus on our efforts, uh, not just on planting native species, but on conserving and restoring living landscapes wherever possible. Uh, ultimately, we need, no, more, we need more than just an oak tree planted here or a milkweed planted there. While we plant these, while planting these species is important and beneficial, uh, when we can restore the native landscape, you know, the ecological context within that these uh, native species once existed within, um, that's when we can optimize a soil's ability to sequester carbon after the plants that have removed it from the atmosphere have completed their life cycles. You know, these wetland areas, the reason they're able to sequester so much carbon is because they stay wet. And so there's uh, these what's called anoxic conditions in these soils. There's not a lot of oxygen. And because of that, the bacteria that live there are what are known as anaerobic bacteria. They like these low oxygen or anoxic conditions. Well, anaerobic bacteria are much less efficient at breaking things down than aerobic bacteria. Uh, so decomposition happens very, very slowly in these wetland soils. And so that means that typically you get a buildup of carbon because as plants grow and sequester carbon from the atmosphere uh, and then they die and fall down, they're decomposing at a much slower rate uh, than. Uh, carbon's being added to it. So uh, you get up, end up with a buildup of carbon over time. That's why uh, when, you know, the early settlers, the European settlers moved in to large, uh, you know, the Ohio Valley or the Mississippi River Valley, and they would, uh, you know, drain a lot of the wetlands because they were so rich in carbon um, and they would use these agriculturally. Well, we've lost so much, many of our wetlands, um, you know, and that, you know, has, you know, re reduced our capacity to, um, uh, fight climate change. You know, same with temperate grasslands, you know, these long, deep, fibrous root systems, you know, when these plants die, uh, those roots decompose and add to the soil carbon, you know, and as more plants grow, uh, they're helping uh, sequester uh, that carbon uh, into the soil. So this is where I want to also consider natural infrastructure, not just green infrastructure, but natural infrastructure. This is an approach that makes use of naturally occurring landscape features, uh, naturalized areas that are managed to provide benefits to both the environment and society. This can include forests, floodplains, wetland protection, watershed restoration, wetland restoration, and conservation easements. 
Uh, natural infrastructure, such as healthy wetlands, grasslands, and forests can provide many of the same benefits of traditional human-made infrastructure, uh, but at a much lower overall investment and maintenance cost. So when we have these areas, instead of replacing a wetland or a prairie, how can we make use of this and incorporate this into um, our design um, or, you know, our environment, you know? How can we make use of this, uh, preserve it, and even manage it in a way that it's optimizing, uh, you know, its ability to provide these free services, not just ecologically, but to society as well. I mean, unlike traditional human-made structures, well-designed and maintained natural infrastructure will not depreciate or you know, fall apart over time. Uh, like an artificial system would, you know, that it's going to need repairs. In fact, these may actually increase in value over time as they become more um, as, you know, valuable to society. Um, so natural infrastructure also provides other benefits beyond uh, to society, of course. I mean, it's wildlife habitats, carbon sequestration, water filtration, groundwater storage, flood water attenuation. You know, if we have a wetland, it's a great opportunity to turn it into a park or, a, you know, a, a public, um, you know, public asset, wetlands, grasslands, these are all community assets. And if we can really start to see them as such and learn how we can use these living landscapes um, instead of replacing them, then I feel like we could uh, have a much greater impact on a, not only improving um, ecological quality, but environmental quality as well. So with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I hope that, you know, as gardeners and landscapers, you know, that you know, we tend to continue to learn more and more about uh, the native plants that are able to target specific contaminants and how we can uh, be strategic in selecting these, uh, not, you know, for to broaden our perspective beyond pollinators, you know, that's, you know, pollinators, that's a very important thing to consider, but I'd like to, to see more of a broader perspective and how can we use these um, in other ways as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. This has been amazing, fabulous, a dizzying array. You obviously paid attention in chemistry class. <laughs> and so um, we appreciate your expertise and sharing what you know and introducing us to this really important topic. We are going to hang on for just a few minutes longer to address some of the um, uh, really challenging and, and important questions that have been raised. I'm going to start with one that was raised um, prior to the program, but has been brought up a number of times in the Q&A today. And that is about best practices um, relating, yes, we love our pollinators and wild, wild ones. So many of these host plants, many of those big four, all of those big four are host plants for many species. And so there is concern about what happens when pollinators or um, insects, Lepidoptera, are feeding on these plants? What, what happens when they are feeding on plants that have been used in remediation projects? And also what happens, what's potentially the impact on people? Because again, some of those plants have edible, uh, the Jerusalem artichoke for one is has an edible part to it and a lot of people use it um, as, a, as an edible. So if you could touch on that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just to um, start with the edible, you know, and the, you know, I'm, I love, you know, I grew up foraging with my parents, you know, and I'm a, a, a modern forager. I like, uh, you know, sourcing food from the land I live on, uh, you know, in the wild and wherever I have permission to, to gather and try to gather sustainably. Uh, but there's one thing, the more I've learned about phytoremediation, the more I have, you know, the more I've uh, done environmental site assessments, um, you know, throughout my career, the more I have learned that there's contamination. Uh, it's not our grandparents' landscape anymore. You know, cattails aren't, you know, depending on where you're um, foraging these things from, you know, they're not as, you know, uncontaminated like they used to be. So uh, it's definitely something to consider. Um, now, as far as the specific organic contaminants, you know, depending on the, the mechanism the plant is using, some of these are being broken down into, uh, you know, harmless, non-toxic components, you know, so uh, in those situations, it's, it's not as much of a concern. However, you know, things like heavy metals, you know, I know there's uh, been quite a bit of research I've, read, I've seen, you know, about bees and pollinators uh, coming into contact with heavy metals through the pollen and even bringing those heavy metals back to their hives. Um, you know, and that's really something I would like to see a lot more research conducted on is uh, what is the impact of not just a contaminant, um, you know, the contaminants that we find, you know, in urban soils in general, what it, how, do, how does this impact, uh, what part, what is translocated, uh, and what does enter the trophic chain. 
Um, yes, uh, that's a very valid concern, and I, I don't know that I have a great answer on that one. You know, uh, I will say that uh, when it comes to larger scale remediation, um, they do take measures to prevent um, these contaminants from entering uh, the trophic chain. When you know, when it comes to larger animals like deer, you want to prevent herbivory, and so definitely keeping these things fenced off. But not just you know, fences can always keep out the pollinators. So uh, they have developed. A willow and poplar hybrids uh, they've hybridized with other species that uh, does make them infertile uh, so they aren't producing uh, flowers and pollen and whatnot and so uh, you know that prevents them a from being able to get out and naturalize into the environment as a uh, hybridized form but also uh, prevents these contaminants from entering the trophic chain uh, i believe there's um, uh, some folks doing some research up in new york um, uh, on uh, willow and uh, popular hybrids uh, for that purpose. I, I wish I, you know, think about the top of my head, I'd have to go look at my references, but um, yeah, that, that'd be a, a direction to point you in if you want to learn more about that. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. And um, I, surprisingly, this wasn't raised. This wasn't a question that I thought many people would ask and, and few did, but I think it's really, really important because you mentioned site assessment. I mean, how do you know what the contamination is? Right. Um, and so if, you know, someone asked, how can average homeowners um, or owners of modest properties identify contamination in the first place? So if you could touch on, on what testing methods you need to do to start this process. Right. Uh, well, uh, you might reach out to a local environmental testing lab. Uh, those are, we typically contract uh, them out to test. Like if we have discovered contamination at a site, you know, and we have to go on to what's called a phase two environmental site assessment to determine what's the extent and level of contamination. You know, uh, <clears throat> there's certain ways of testing to um, soil, groundwater, all that. They can take the samples back to the lab and uh, determine um, what sort of contamination is there and I mean you could uh, pay for that um, you know a lot of times uh, you know like I don't know if this is common in every state but the state I live in every homeowner is entitled to one free soil test a year with the county extension but that really just looks at nutrients pH and things that you would need to know to grow a garden that's not going to look at contaminants that's where you really need uh, if you google environmental testing lab in your area uh, you might see that several uh, pop up, um, especially in areas, you know, that are more urban, because there is a need for that uh, for um, just sort of, you know, anytime there's a property transaction and there's a loan, uh, a lot of times banks will require a phase one environmental site assessment to occur. So that way the bank knows what sort of liability they might be taking on if the loan was defaulted on. So um, <clears throat> now uh, some universities will also provide this testing. The University of Arkansas, um, you could pay, they have, you know, a soil lab and a, um, a um, water quality lab where you know where you can uh, pay a fee and submit a sample and they will test for um, you know certain elements um, in those those specimens so uh, just kind of look at your maybe your local university look at a private environmental testing lab um, and uh, I would say go from there. Awesome. Thank you. And be, you know, and you might be strategic about where you take that sample from if you're looking for a particular type of contaminant you know you know so you know, not every place on a piece of property, you know, there can be variation. So especially when it comes to heavy metals and um, contaminants that are more immobile. Very good, thank you. Um, we've had some, and I think we need a little clarification on which, when plants are performing different functions uh, in terms of remediation, what the, um, the disposal looks like. Um, I think the, there's been a little bit of fixation in the audience on the removal of plant materials. And, right. and there are some instances, I think, that you touched on earlier in the program where you, you're not necessarily having to remove those materials. So if you could touch a little bit on what um, instances you would need to physically remove and what that looks like. Yeah, well, I mean, there's going to be uh, the herbaceous species at the end of the growing season, these, you know, the above ground portion dies and decomposes and it's going to put whatever elements it has translocated into those above ground portions back to the top of the soil and that's a concern. So that's where uh, when you have a site where you're trying to remediate it for say, um, you know, heavy metals, you're going to have to remove uh, at least above ground portion um, and then make sure that you're 
you know, sometimes it might be incinerating it in a safe type of, you know, enclosure where you're able to capture things uh, volatile, you know, some metals like lead can become volatile. You don't want those getting out. Uh, so there are, you know, I would check with, you know, local state regulations. Um, you know, there might, you know, you might have to find a certain landfill that accepts hazardous waste, you know, it's, you know, when it comes to these heavy metals, you know, it's just, you know, really it's moving them from one site to another, but that's where I really hope that uh, the science of phyto mining uh, can really develop and we can figure out how can we reclaim these, um, you know, and reclaim them efficiently to where it becomes economically uh, viable for this to be an alternative method to traditional mining. So, um, you know, and then when it comes to the woody species, you know, these are sequestered into that woody biomass, which isn't, you know, gonna, you know, decompose at the end of the year but you know a lot of trees and uh, shrubs and whatnot do have a point where they you know you know have plateaued out on the amount of woody biomass so if there's still that contamination in the soil uh, or if there's a concern about uh, some of the you know uh, contaminant being uh, getting into the trophic chain from herbivory, uh, then those might have to be removed and disposed of in the same way as the herbaceous species. They just probably wouldn't need to be uh, removed as often or annually like you would uh, the herbaceous species. And for deciduous leaves of, of woody species, that would be something mm -hmm. that you would want to remove as well, potentially. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and then uh, we had one couple questions come in about um, obstacles to actually implementing these types of projects, both mm -hmm. um, in private, the private sector and in um, the, the public municipal municipalities. Can you talk a little bit, about, because people talk in Wild Ones a lot about barriers to native landscaping, mm -hmm. and this seems like it might be even taking it a step further. So if you could touch on that a little. Yeah, well, honestly, I feel like with this, uh, one of our largest barriers, even within the native plant community has just been our awareness and education of, uh, being able to do this. So as uh, an environmental professional that, you know, works on uh, low impact development projects uh, with, uh, you know, the different firms that I've worked for over my career, um, you know, they would usually hire, have me select the native species uh, for rain gardens, bioswells, uh, detention ponds. And so I would just, you know, I've really just have always enjoyed geeking out over the stuff in my spare time. So I've developed like a, you know, a trove of research papers and articles and books on the topic and maintain my own list and database of um, various species and what they're good for. So I've always just tried to select species for rain garden design projects. You know, switchgrass is a great example for rain garden. Mix it in there. Make sure you're including some switchgrass uh, with, you know, your pollinator species as well, because that's going to help uh, break down some contaminants. Um, that's just one that you see, you know, you saw it pop up throughout my presentation, you know. So, I mean, let's just, you know, learn more about it. And if you already are developing or designing uh, a native landscape, um, you know, think about, I just want to encourage people to think about surrounding land uses or what might, what contaminants might be entering that site and what species could they mix in there uh, to help um, remediate that contaminant. Now, outside of that, as far as getting natives into the landscape, I mean, uh, I think that, you know, it's the same barriers we, we have in, you know, in any case. And, you know, I think a lot of that, there's the, you know, public education, you need that public buy-in. You know, most people think native plants, well, you know, isn't that poison ivy? You know, <laughs> you know, that's one comment I got. I spoke to a local rotary club and uh, that's what somebody asked. I was like, well, yeah, but, you know, it's not just poison ivy, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, this is educating people and showing people that, you know, there are all kinds of beautiful native options for wildflowers that we can use uh, instead of some of these non-native, you know, and it's also just a sense of local pride in your local landscape, you know. You know, uh, you know, I'm here from the Mid-South, you know, and, you know, I love the flora that we have here. And so I want to see more of it. Uh, and I, I'm fortunate enough to live in the part of Arkansas where native plant landscaping has really taken off here uh, and um, in the part of Arkansas I live in. There's a lot of uh, municipal projects um, and commercial landscaping that are making more and more use of these uh, native plants. And so... Um, you know, I think it starts in these uh, hubs across the country and then it eventually spreads. I mean, I would say a place like, you know, Arkansas is going to be, you know, not one of the first. It's going to try something new and fringe. But hey, if we're using it here in Arkansas, then we're not too far off from, you know, it being, you know, eventually spread into, you know, even more, you know, rural areas. So, um, 
Well, bravo for, for all the work that you do <laughs> in Arkansas and the fact that you've brought this to a national audience. We really, really appreciate it. Sure. Um, the the Q&A has been a, a wealth of potential journal articles. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we, we are going to have to tap some of that and and um, maybe tap you for some of your expertise and maybe recruit sure. you to write an article on this for the journal. I would love um, to. We are going to be uh, sharing a few uh, links in the chat. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about what Wild Ones does, um, uh, we're going to be posting some of those links and we're going to be opening up the chat just so you can express your gratitude to Eric for bringing all of this wonderful um, wealth of knowledge to us tonight. Um, I mentioned the journal that is going to be uh, something that Wild Ones has put out and continues to put out quarterly. We do a quarterly journal that um, features member requested articles. So in a case like this, we, we tap your questions and realize, recognize that um, people are, need answers. And so you will find articles touching on subjects like these in the journal, as well as lists of native plants. I saw someone po post a question going, where can you get the big four? Well, thankfully, those are actually four species you can get. <laughs> they're they're, they're common, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the harder to find species. The big four are available, readily available in the seed trade. So look for seed, you will find it. Um, if you enjoyed this program, uh, Wild Ones does host a series of webinars and we encourage you to save the date. On January 13th, a uh, fellow board member, Matthew Ross will be presenting on America's Public Gardens, a resource for native plants. So an evening of inspiration and Matthew is a fabulous and fun speaker. So you won't wanna miss that. Registration will be opening in the next few days. So please make sure you're on our mailing list or visit our website to register for that. Um, I do encourage you to stay in touch with Wild Ones through social media. Um, I know that many of our chapters have media channels and our national channel, um, nation, national um, organization also um, puts out a lot of information that uh, you'll want to stay in touch with. And also, we have to date over 6,000 members over 70, we're at 76 chapters in 23 states. And if um, you are interested in joining us, please visit our website and become a member. If you can't find a chapter in your area, please consider starting one. This is, this is how the organization grows. This is how the movement grows. Uh, this is how we pollinate around the country, how and why to landscape with native plants. We do appreciate your feedback on our webinars, so please, if you will take a moment um, to fill out the survey, we're going to drop a link in the chat to that, as well as um, send the survey along with uh, the link to the recording um, in uh, a very short amount of time. It usually doesn't take us very long to, to get that up online. So again, thank you, Eric, really. This has been just such a, an amazing evening of knowledge and I hope that you all enjoy the remainder of your evening and have a joyful holiday season. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and um, yeah, uh, thank you all for listening to me ramble. Awesome. <laughs> Good night, everybody.